the second of my uh, D&D 5e uh, prep streams on Roll20. Uh, today I'm going to be prepping Vault of Terrors, uh, which will incidentally also be the uh, first game that we've streamed. Uh, we're going to be uh, recording and streaming it later today. Uh, it's the same group as my Dragon Hunters group. And um, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, when you, if and when you watch either the stream, which will be going live uh, 7 p.m. GMT to 11 p.m. GMT, uh, or the uh, recording, which will be up for 14 days after that. And I'm thinking I'm going to start maybe doing... Uh, either maybe a YouTube channel or um, uh, possibly a Patreon uh, to get access to the videos uh, either way um, you'll be able to access them in some fashion after 14 days for sure or maybe I'll invest in Twitch Prime <laughs> that's certainly what Twitch would like me to do but yeah so Vault of Terrors um, we have a player away this week for my Friday game uh, in Dragon Hunters and since that player uh, is the player of the player character, um, Steph, uh, is playing Kaylin Galanadel, and unfortunately uh, she died quite recently. Um, you guys, uh, anyone watching may remember from the last stream, um, the encounter I built uh, for the party to come rescue her soul from the Shadowfell from a Skull Lord. Uh, as, as she's the one that's away, um, we've decided to do a one-shot. So, I'm doing a one-shot set in the same world. Vault of Terrors is uh, another of the uh, Sorcerer King's uh, dungeons in, in the setting that they're in. There are five Sorcerer Kings. They're a bit like the Rune Lords um, from Pathfinder. Uh, a bit like uh, all the other Mad Wizard Kings that have, uh, well, Sorcerer Kings in this case, that have existed throughout um, fantasy history. Um, don't pretend mine are particularly original, but uh, there's five of them. Uh, in this case, um, the party in uh, the Dragon Hunters game has discovered this tomb, um, but they never went in. They found some mine works around it, um, but uh, they were a little busy because they were very low level, and uh, a, uh, a wormling white dragon was attempting to hunt them down through these mines. Um, so they found the tomb entrance, but they never went in. So what we're going to do today um, is uh, we're going to go in, but with a different party of adventurers, of so 10th level, uh, D and D fifth edition adventurers um, into the tomb of Rakos the Maddening, and uh, like the other Sorcerer King tombs, um, they've gradually figured out uh, that in each of them there is an orb of dragon magic, which is uh, my refluffed version uh, re and slightly rebuilt version of the uh, orbs of dragon kind from Dragonlands. Um, my orbs are a bit stronger, a bit more dangerous. Um, a bit more active. Uh, they're, they're intelligent artifacts. They have the soul of a great dragon in them. Um, they're quite important to the other plot, so we'll see if this uh, one-shot party manages to get this one out. So, the reason it's called Vault of Terrors, unbeknownst to the party, um, is because I've decided the theme of this dungeon. Um, I think it's important to have a general theme, um, for particularly for a one-shot, and particularly for a dungeon, in this case, particularly because I'm doing one map as well, uh, it's important to have a simple, clear, consistent theme that uh, <laughs> uh, subtlety is difficult in role-playing games in general. Um, uh, you partially because much like murder mysteries and so forth, you actually want the the players uh, to figure out the themes. Uh, that you you sort of need to. Not hit them on the head with it, but um, be clear, consistent, and obvious with the theme. So, the theme of this one is going to be fear. So, I've done a couple of searches through the Monster Manual. I I've taken the liberty of uh, doing a Blue Peter on you guys. Um, the map, I've already set up most of the dynamic lighting, because I don't think you guys need to see me uh, drawing lines. Um, I'm... Because uh, I've been watching Boss Keys, uh, a great series on YouTube that talks about the various Legend of Zelda dungeon designs, and because I've been doing a lot more dungeon design recently because of my other homebrew game, God Home, um, that has a load of um, elemental temples in it, a bit like the Princes of the Apocalypse. 
um, and the Temple of Elemental Evil uh, stuff earlier in D&D 5e and in previous editions of D&D and Pathfinder as well. I've been thinking a lot about dungeon design, so I'm going to be stealing a bit. Um, it's always uh, the best idea is that there's nothing original under the sun, so if there's an idea that works in something else and you think you can make it work in, in your role-playing games, then go ahead and nab it, change it a little bit, twist it, bop it, shake it, make it your own, um, and then uh, use it uh, to best effect. So for this one, um, a couple of the ideas I'm going to be using um, are one, keys, there are going to be big doors, um, in non-obvious places um, between the main areas and they're going to have keys uh, which turns the rooms into slightly micro challenges they can pick the locks I'm not a big fan of completely unpickable locks um, if they want to and if they want to well, although it's not a good idea uh, they can batter down the doors as well um, but uh, the far, e far, far easier way to get through the big doors is going to be the keys. Uh, I'm going to put the keys, um, like in Zelda, um, in chests. I'm going to put chests um, on the ethereal plane uh, because that's going to be the second theme of this dungeon. Um, along with along with fear, um, I noticed when I was building this map that there was uh, a lot of black space on the outside of the maps uh, it's meant to be uh, like it's, it makes the, the map squares look pretty it means I know where um, the sort of edge of the, the space is uh, for dungeon maps uh, it's, it's a good idea um, but uh, looking at it got me thinking what if now if you look back at the dynamic lighting I dynamically encased the outside of these black spaces as well because uh, players in dungeons particularly are extremely want <laughs> to want to do things like um, batter down walls um, and dig dig through obstacles uh, particularly to avoid traps if they can't if they can't dismantle the trap uh, then they'll dig through a wall or an obstacle, or they'll they'll do something that seems ludicrous, but they can theoretically do within the rules if they have enough time and enough strength and a big enough sledgehammer. Um, so, uh, knowing knowing my players and knowing their predilection towards such out of the box strategy, I think what I'm going to do to to accommodate them, but also to deal with that problem is I'm going to put them in a bigger box. I'm going to put two boxes and have the uh, areas that are outside of the mapped dungeon but still have uh, black squares on them. I think I'm going to have them be a sort of shadowy, smoky void uh, that you can go into. And in fact, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide the boss of the dungeon uh, in this main area. Um, I've decided the boss of this dungeon is a beholder and that this uh, tomb of a sorcerer king has been taken over by it and made into its lair. Uh, luckily, as uh, we'll see in a bit, um, beholders are almost right on the money uh, with regards to uh, deadly threats. Uh, for a 10th level party uh, Beholders in Lairs specifically which is fantastic um, they also fit the fear theme uh, I've decided that therefore um, going on that theme um, that if the theme of the dungeon is fear and the, the big boss of it is a Beholder uh, then uh, what Beholders are known for are nightmares um, they they dream things up. They go they go insane. They warp reality around them, and they dream up monsters around them that are reflections of their own fears. So I'm thinking the monsters in this dungeon are nightmare creations of the beholder's own mind. Um, 
Further, I know where the Orb of Dragon magic is that the players are looking for nominally as the sort of objective. The Beholder's eaten it. <laughs> this has done two things to the Beholder. The first thing it's done uh, is given it blink at will. I can't control it, in fact. It's just going to keep blinking. Um, the second thing it's done is uh, when it blinks, obviously, it can see through the ethereal plane, which means it can see through walls. Um, and it, it can see quite a distance through walls. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, just checking the ranges on this. Yeah, that's about, that's about right. It's going to cover most of the dungeon, but not all of the dungeon. So there are going to be safe areas. Um, is I'm going to have the whole dungeon be the Beholder's Lair. The Beholder knows that some intruders have entered the dungeon, but it thinks that it's uh, the Dragon Hunters are more nightmares. Um, so uh, it's going to deal with them in the same way that it deals with its other nightmares when, when they scare it, uh, which is it's going to use the lair actions against them. Uh, and it's going to, when it blinks, it's going to look at them. <laughs> uh, not necessarily with its eye rays, because the lair actions only let it use its eye rays within 60 feet, which means that these rooms, these central rooms, I'm going to put easier encounters in them, but they're going to be made more difficult because the Beholder can theoretically use the one random eye ray lair action at them um, within these four rooms. Um, on the outer rooms, they're safer, but um, the Beholder is going to be looking in a random direction each round because I like to do my dungeons in round by round anyway. Uh, there's too many traps. Too many things that can sort of trigger simultaneously. It lets everybody track um, exactly what's going on and uh, where they are when, th when events happen, encounters trigger. Um, and uh, it's gridded anyway. So it just feels fairer, more organized, easier to track. Um, particularly, particularly with one shots, um, where the goal is more to sort of survive the dungeon and have a good time in some ways than uh, than a, like a, a campaign as such. I'm calling the uh, beholder cat, by the way. Um, uh, the reason I'm calling it this is because I found a. Ooh, uh -huh. I'll actually upload the art. Um, is I found a fantastic poem about nightmares. And I was wondering what I was going to use these weird squiggly runes about this uh, map. I've constructed this from tiles from uh, Gabriel Pickard's Wizard's Lair map. Because this was originally a Sorcerer King's Lair. I'm thinking the uh, Sorcerer King incidentally has been disintegrated. Um, and uh, Cat has his skull uh, that he uses a bit like Yorick is used uh, by Hamlet. I'm, I'm hoping that'll be a fun fun part of that encounter. Um, so... Where was I? Yeah, so the, the Beholders go look in a random direction and every, uh, every round uh, that they're in the dungeon. And everyone knows that if, you, if a Beholder looks at you um, uh, and it has its main eye open, uh, it projects an anti-magic field, um, which... Uh, will go through the walls, uh, unfortunately, for the players. Um, so, I'm thinking I'm going to stock the dungeon a bit um, based on areas um, with fear-causing monsters, N not only scary monsters, but I did a, a search for a challenge rating appropriate um, fear-based monsters, uh, and monsters that have spells like Fear, Phantasmal Killer, and um, uh, similar abilities, Phantasm abilities. Uh, I've, I've, I'm hoping uh, in one place I'm going to put a... a ch I'm gonna <laughs> so I'm using chests. A uh, great thing about chests is there are chest-based monsters, so there's going to be a mimic in this dungeon. One of the chests is going to be a mimic. It's not going to be the first chest either. Um, because uh, uh, all the second chest, because the chests uh, to for mimics to work, because um, my my players are so experienced with D and D that they are wary of chests, which is a good thing. Um, but for for them to sort of work and be scary, 
um, you need them to, uh, particularly if they're a chest, uh, you need them to um, want to open the chest anyway, even if they think it's potentially a mimic. So, this could be a mimic. Uh, the other thing I'm going to put in one of the chests um, is some of the chests aren't going to have keys in them, and some of the chests are going to have keys and magic items in them. One of the chests is going to have a key, maybe, and a magic item, which is going to appear to be a magical cloak. I'm thinking it's going to be a good magical cloak as well, or appear to be. It's actually not a magical cloak. So there, there's an illusion over it, because illusions are going to be another big theme in this dungeon, because... Uh, Raycos the Maddening himself was a sort of illusionist sorcerer. Um, that's why he was called Raycos the Maddening. And initially, this tomb was uh, sort of set up with a series of illusion-based traps, but they've been mostly, um, well, shorted out by continually being hit by anti-magic by the Beholder. Um, so, <laughs> uh, the cloak in this chest um, is not a cloak. It is a fantastic monster that you don't get to use very well very often, uh, called a cloaker. Um, it fits the theme of the dungeon extremely well, um, because it is by itself a, also a fear-based monster. Wonderful thing. They're very dumb. They're, they're really not a, a, a sort of an enemy that you'd... Uh, I'd normally use anyway, um, because they're a legacy sort of... Um, uh, they're a legacy sort of enemy from uh, old D and D, where you have the the really weird enemies like ropers and cloakers and stuff like that. Um, they're almost designed as gags, um, but in this instance, again, because it's got um, it's got a phantasm ability, it's got a moan ability that frightens, um, and uh, it's got the false appearance ability. It, it's just a uh, a good monster uh, for a fear-based dungeon. So we're going to use a cloaker. We're going to use a mimic. I'm just putting them in the center for the moment until I uh, move them about. Um, one of the interesting monsters I found that's going to be an interesting sort of mini boss, I think, in one of the outer areas, um, is uh, the Dao, uh, the Earth Genies. Um, they have a number of fear based abilities, which is not actually something I knew, um, but they do. So we're going to use some of them, or one of them at least. I'm thinking. In terms of uh, the three pillars, uh, obviously exploration, there's a big map to explore. I'm probably going to put a few traps in as well that haven't been, like mechanical traps that haven't been destroyed by the anti-magic fields. Um, and uh, the runes, uh, there's going to be some of the runes that are going to lead to this. This is one of the few areas where they can go that isn't affected by the Beholder's Stair um, because it's, it's underneath everything. And he doesn't look down very often. Um, but the only way you can get to it is by finding the right runes to teleport to it. Um, so I'm going to put four... It's going to be like a crossroads. I'm going to put a, a rune here, a rune here, a rune here, and a rune here. And um, it's going to be a sort of transport hub. And it, once they work that out, they'll be able to also work out that they can short rest there. I'm not expecting them to get long rest. I'm going to plan on building... Um, using the adjusted XP per day... Uh, on page 84 of the DMG and the encounter guidelines in both the DMG and Xanathar's <laughs> I'm going to build a day's worth of encounter into the dungeon because it's a one shot and we want to finish it so I've got my deadly encounter here Mr. Beholder I've got my um, oh, at this level Uh, the Dao's somewhere between a, a medium and a, and a hard difficulty encounter, so um, I think I'll probably leave leave it as that. Um, I think with minions it'll probably be a bit too difficult. I, I only I want the want the beholder to be the difficult encounter, the really difficult encounter. Uh, the cloaker and the mimic are smaller encounters. They're fairly easy. Um, uh, they're just 
they're just funny, essentially. That they're more interesting and more interactive than traps. So we're going to use those. Um, another enemy I was considering using that I'm going to use on the in, in the internal rooms because that so they can move through the walls and give the idea that to the players that maybe they can move through the walls as well somehow um, is banshees. Uh, banshees uh, are another fear-based enemy, um, and I can use a couple of them as an encounter uh, with. I can use three of them as a medium encounter. And they're still a difficult enemy at this level because uh, their whale is a death effect. So we'll use a couple of those. Um, so part of the reason I'm, I'm putting them in the center at the moment uh, is because I haven't fully decided on exactly where I'm going to place these enemies aside from the beholder. Um, it's I'm fairly certain I'm going to put the Dow in one of the corner rooms of this map that isn't this one. Uh, I don't want them to fight it out to start off with. That's too hard. I think I'm probably looking at this. I'm probably going to put them in either here, um, because we've got this sort of stage for them here, or in here. This is a pretty big room. They benefit from having a, a large space because they they have a summon ability. They themselves are, are large sized. Um. Yeah, I think they suit this area better. So let's put them in here for the moment. And I think we'll put them in here because that way, sneaky players, with regards to the exploration aspect, sneaky players can sneak up here and go round, round them, theoretically. And um, tactical players, uh, if they anger the Dao, um, I think we'll, probably, no, we'll put it in the middle for the moment. I might adjust its position, depending on if they're approaching from... That's something you can do, something I do a lot, is uh, pl initial placement of enemies is really important um, for, in terms of how difficult a combat encounter is. Like if they're, for instance, if you've got a full melee party, if they're out of the reach of one move and attack, then that already makes the combat more difficult. It means they get one of their abilities off. Um, so one of the things you can do, really easy to just, just very, very fine-tune encounter difficulty in the moment, both in in D and D and Five E, uh, and in, and in Pathfinder, is depending on the angle they're approaching the encounter from, you can adjust the distance from where they see the monster. Um, so if they were approaching from here and I wanted to make it more difficult, I could move the Dow over here. Uh, and if, they, if I wanted to make it more easy, I'd probably put him in the center. Because in the center, he's easily within a speed. Uh, over here, if I put him in the corner, uh, it's gonna, well, some of them won't be able to reach him from the back and uh, the, the front ones will have to expo overexpose themselves because for all they know there could be monsters about to come out of this door or these doors. But for the moment I think we're gonna, we're gonna leave him here. Here? Here. There we go. So we've placed that. Uh, I think I'm gonna have the Banshees wander and try and hint that they've been conjured by these circles. So let's put one of them here. One of them. Uh, yeah, there. That's that's quite nice. That's one of the things you can do um, with regards to dungeon design is is red herrings. Um, if I put them, if I put the banshees in the circles and uh, describe the banshees appearing out of nowhere in the middle of a magic circle, uh, any, any player is going to think, hmm, they've been summoned by something, or that's a summon trap or something like that. When in fact, most of these glyphs mean nothing. Some of them, uh, going back to the uh, reason that the beholder is called cat, um, some, some of these uh, are going to be uh, for um, <laughs> the beholder has been using the glyphs uh, to write beholder poetry. 
about its nightmares. Uh, so this could be a nice little Easter egg uh, for the players who think to try and translate the glyphs um, with uh, comprehend languages or tongues or whatever, that they're going to be able to read some Beholder poetry all about nightmares. Well, in turn, uh, that that's a sort of Easter egg as to sort of what the hidden theme of the dungeon is all about. So, the cloaker and the mimic, I'm going to place wherever I place the chests. Uh, talking of which, I need to look for good places to put chests. So, pardon me. Uh, I'm using dungeon decor uh, for chests. I'm going to use different chests per room, I think, if I've got enough chests. Hopefully I've got eight. Buried chest, large chest, medium chest, small chest. I've got six small chests. Hmm. Oh, I see. Some of them are open. Okay. Well, I guess I'll. I guess I use three types of chests then. That's okay. So let's have a look. So in this room, this place is the obvious place to put that chest because they're going to appear uh, as if out of nowhere. GM layer. Savvy players are going to work out that something might well appear there. Uh, again, if they think to use things like detect magic and so forth, uh, they're going to realize that there's... Or, or have an ability to look onto the ethereal plane. That would be particularly impressive. I don't think they will. They, they don't tend to um, think about that. But uh, if they did, um, again, uh, Easter eggs, hidden rewards, they are 10th level. It's entirely possible that they would, but I don't think they will. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think in this one, I think this is going to be the Mimic encounter. So we're going to put the Mimic there. Uh, and I'm going to sort of subtly signpost it by the fact that unlike all the other chests, which I'm going to try and put at the top of steps, um, I'm not going to put the mimic at top steps. So smart players, uh, players that are pattern watching, uh, may well realise that there's something different about that. Uh, now let's use this chest here. better. And uh, then in this one I think we're going to put a chest over here. That's the other way to unlock these chests also is uh, I'm thinking the way the, the chests appear because the beholder is mad and it wants someone to actually come and help it with its nightmares. Um, so the Chests will appear um, when they defeat the nightmares of each encounter to represent the beholder um, giving them keys to get into various areas um, to be able to reach it. If they don't figure out that they need to go through the walls somehow or break through the walls somehow um, to, to get into the hidden areas, um, eventually they're going to reach here and there's going to be one of the glyphs that take them to this crossroads um, and one of the other glyphs in this crossroads um, actually no, I think I think what I'm probably going to do again to get them thinking about it um, is I think I'm probably going to have uh, all four of these glyphs go to different areas of the dungeon but not into the smoky areas and then um, to actually get into the smoky areas I think I'm going to they're going to have to work out that they need to step into these pools of magic and any of them are going to take them uh, through I think stepping into the pools of magic are going to make them uh, ethereal 
for a period of time, or possibly cause them to blink. I'm still not entirely decided on that. I'll have to look up the relevant spell effects to work out uh, which one is a bit more balanced. Um, but one of the two. One of the two. Okay, so with this one, I think I'm going to put the cloaker in this room. And again, I'm going to signpost it by having the chest not be next to some steps. Probably going to use a bigger chest as well. Because, I mean, look at, look at the size of that thing. Put that on that layer. Let's use this chest, yeah, maybe. Mm. Let's use this one. Remember, um, if you need to reposition something, um, you can always press Alt and reposition it. Yeah. Oh. Press Alt before you click on it. <laughs> Probably put that there. Just, yeah, avoidance of doubt. I'm GM layering the things that aren't actually on, like, in the walls, essentially. Um, so we got some Banshees. We got a Dao encounter. We got a Cloaker. We got all the chests. Need to put a chest in the Dao room. That's fine. Put that one here. That fits the rule. Chest here. Oh, we got got a chest there. Okay. Now we need to add a, add a few more encounters. I think some some easy stuff. So I'm looking at the monster lists at the moment for CR. There's a really good PDF on the Wizards website. Uh, that is all of the, the monster manual and the Volo's Guide to Monsters um, rated by CR, by type by pretty much everything you'd need in one PDF. I hope they add Tome of Foes to it, but there are other indexes that uh, work for Tome of Foes. <laughs> uh, one of my uh, players uh, have decided that they're offended. Um. <laughs> no, you guys are amazing. Um, I'm very clever, um, but uh, the medium means that sometimes I, I have to use a hammer rather than a, a, a fine tool uh, to provide you with themes. <laughs> <laughs> Doubtful, hmm, huh? <laughs> uh, no, please believe. Please believe. Uh, honest. Uh, okay. So. For this one. Uh, so one of the things I, I was doing before before I um, started the stream was I was going through the monster manual volos and uh, ah yeah Bargoras ah they're wonderful yeah so Bargoras can use phantasmal force um, which is a fair effect and they're a good monster, so I think we'll probably use a Bulgora. Uh, that's not a bad initial encounter, actually, a Bulgora. Or two. Why, why, why not two? So let's put a Bulgora in this big room here. Phantasmal Force projects a... Um, 
uh, an image of something that the character fears that can psychically damage it if they believe it's real, um, which is a, a good ability and, and very on theme. Uh, this room is uh, a nice room for a bog or a fight in as well because they have a, a wide uh, AoE sort of uh, effect. Uh, I think we'll put him there for the moment. Again, he looks like he's coming out of a circle. Um, but Aboleths are also very on theme, but I, I've overused Aboleths in other one shots. So, we're not going to use them. Uh, I could use a Githzerai a gift Zerai Zerth, um, which I have considered because that could be um, some sort of either prisoner or social encounter, um, and their knowledge of the astral plane means that it's not an unlikely conversation topic um, to come up with a gift Zerai or a gift Yankee about teleportation, movement through walls, that sort of thing, gives them another chance to have a conversation that makes them think that maybe, just maybe, they can go into the wall spaces. So, yeah, I, no, I'm, I'm talking myself into it as I talk about it. So let, let's, let's make the Githzerai a prisoner of the Tao, I think. Zerth's about strong enough. I mean, he doesn't need any monks or anything. He's predominantly designed to be a social encounter. And he's got Phantasmal Killer, which means he's, again, completely on theme. So we'll put him in here. There we go, he fits nicely into a circle. Uh, which reminds me, I'm going to put the Dao here to start off with. And we can move her down to here if we need to. To make it again look like she's coming out of the circles. Um, hmm, these center areas. Uh, another uh, another enemy I was considering using for this one to fit with the eye theme um, is Nothix. Uh, Carnalots have got. Uh, Carnalots aren't really a fear-based enemy, though. Okay. Let's try searching fear. Uh, no thick, so oh spectators. Okay, so we've got to have a spectator in here. Um, the spectator is the f the final hint, I think. Um, we we're, we're gonna have a spectator that is going to be um, like the beholder's fear of sort of impotence or insignificance. Um, it gets the party gives the party a chance to sort of prepare uh, to, to deal with the, the weirdness that is talking to a beholder. It can potentially translate the poetry for them as well um, and make weird comments that um, hint that maybe there's something in the walls. room for it. That's a pretty good room for it, but I think actually I'm gonna have it happen earlier. I think I'm gonna put it in here. Yeah, that space. Uh, introduces them to the theme of the dungeon. Pardon me. Although, having said that, actually, though, hmm. we don't want it to be caught by the Banshees. It could be scared of the Banshees. That's not a bad idea. It probably shouldn't be too close to the Beholder, though. Yeah, no, I think I think that's a 
a good place for it to be, probably. Oh no, actually, no, better. Let's put it. Let's put it over here, because that way it's hiding uh, from the sight of the beholder. What else we got? Demi liches are very on theme, but also considerably too con considerably too powerful for a tenth level party. Um, I know people who have used death knights and demi liches against similar level parties, and it's uh, it's it's not good. It's too good, really. Um. Likewise, pit fiends are too strong. Doppelgangers aren't bad. We should probably put a dragon in, because they are. Um, they are dragon hunters. I think I'm looking at looking for adult whites because uh, only adult dragons get the the frightful presence ability, which is obviously what we sort of want for this one. Mm. On the other hand, I think unlike the other monsters in this dungeon, I think a dragon would fight a beholder. I think I'd have difficulty explaining its presence. How tough a bogor. Could have another bogara. We could have that be the no thick room. Mm. Hags are pretty scary, and hags use fear, but again, they'd be... With with certain types of enemies, particularly intelligent, powerful enemies, I feel like when you're designing a, a sort of dungeon area, uh, you have to be careful how many you put in place. Because to start with, you need to have a reason for them to coexist, and they're not usually the sort that uh, coexist particularly well with each other. Um, and secondly, you, you need to make sure they don't kill each other. <laughs> um, Lilithids, no, Minotaurs. Mm, Minotaurs pretty on theme. But it's not really a labyrinth. Ooh, Oni. Uh, huh, Oni don't have a fear ability. That's really odd, considering they're all about being a nursery, ri nursery rhyme terror. Hmm, okay. Could give it one. Can always, could always homebrew it. Uh, we could also have um, a good ally uh, in the dungeon of some very confused pixies that have been trapped here and that attack anything that goes into uh, into their area. Uh, that's quite tempting. I might do that. They do have a phantasmal ability as well. well let's uh, let's have a look in the other books first. Oh, that was the other thing I was going to use. I was going to use scarecrows. Scarecrows are fantastic. They're a fairly chunky, fairly scary enemy um, that you can use on mass in this sort of situation. So. An easy encounter at this level for the party is 2,400. Uh, six of them is 1,200 times two um, because the six of them is 2,400. So uh, a six-man scarecrow party is is a, a good encounter for them. I say. I think we might do that.
that I might move the Balgura here. Have that big room be a scarecrow room. The uh, other thing I want to do is aside from the beholder, if the walls are movable through and they're a viable encounter area, they need to have something scary that's in them uh, that can pop out uh, at the party as and when necessary. So let's have those four scarecrows in like a conga line. Two up here, two over here. Yeah, that's quite a good setup. Um, instead of in the alcoves, let's put these two over here. Yeah, see, that's already interesting encounter design. Some melee, some ranged. Um, I think we're going to use. So, for moving through walls, uh, particularly for dark areas, we probably want to use either wraiths, devourers, or shadows. So have a look at these. Uh, do wraiths have a fear? Wraiths create spectres and incorporeally move. Shadows are scary, but they. I think they compress themselves. Yeah, they, they're amorphous, so maybe we'll use shadows. Um, oh, shadow horror. I was thinking about using this in the other encounter I was building. That looks suitably scary, and it is a terror, essentially. Uh, does it frighten? It does! Ha 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 ha! Okay, so this can be the... Yeah, th this can be the monster that sort of um, makes the party aware of the fact that they can move about in the walls. Where are we going to put this? You don't want it directly in range of the eye rays. So let's maybe... I think we're going to put this over here. Because this seals off the entrance for them. Or once they're a sufficient distance away, it can come in behind them. And then they suddenly have to deal with this horrifying thing. Pushes them forwards, pushes them towards the banshees and the shadows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah let's, see, let's use a shadow horror. They're, they're, they're a great enemy. Um, we could put it there. Actually, I think we're going to put it here. That way... Theoretically speaking, they can catch a glimpse of it moving across the map. So, it, with regards to that, one of the things you can do with regards to incorporeality um, is uh, you can hide your ruler using hide from others, and then only you can see that ruler. So you can measure distances and do chain moves and so forth. So you get the distances right um, without your players being aware of the movement path. It was an invisible movement path. I find it very useful. And that can be another good reason. Um, the, sh the Shadow Horror can be another good reason for them to be on a timer. Um, because once they cross this threshold, i.e. once they open the first big door, the Shadow Horror becomes aware of them. Yeah, no, I like that. I like that. Um... Hmm. I'm aware. So I've got I got a couple of banshees. Banshees are great and all. Um. I need to do something with this room. I still think I'm going to use Nothix, gibbering, cowering, apprentice, apprentice Nothix. Um. Let me just have a look at the range of their abilities. I might pair a Banshee with a Nothic. But I think Banshees can kill them, theoretically, so... Let's 
They've got 30 feet range. So they're quite a close in, close environs sort of enemy. They have a gaze that's quite good. How many XP are they? Oh, they're quite cheap. Um, we can do... Four of them is 1,800 times two, three, 600. Five of them is four, 500. Which is pretty close, adjusted XP wise, to a medium encounter. So, um, if we tell you what, let's move the banshees. Let's have the banshees be one area, and let's have this one come out of this pool, so the party know that they can do that. That way, they're always going to encounter the banshees. That's always going to be a thing, and they're always going to think about the pools. That's good, right, okay. Which means we can have this, these other three areas littered with no thugs. <laughs> littered with no thugs, oh dear. These were the Sorcerer King's five apprentices, I think, is how we're going to explain these guys. So, they're in the quarters that they once made home. Pardon me. Put this guy in here. Let's put this guy in here. Again, we're keeping to the circle motif. Put this guy in here. Make sure we GM layer that chest. Maybe the Mimic eats the Nothex. Oh, that's not a bad idea. So let's have a dead Nothex here that looks like it's been gnawed on and crawled away. So we'll keep it out of the circle. Have it be... Have this one be dead. That gives the party a good idea. There's something they want to be scared of, maybe, uh, in the room that way. And it gives me a reason to have a, uh, a, ma a object layer chest, because that was the challenge for that room, that unlocked the chest. Aha! It's all coming together. Which obviously is uh, it's not really a chest, it's, uh, it's a mimic. Okay, so let's let's review for a moment. Uh, we've got down the Zerth, that's one encounter. We got the Cloaker and the Spectator, that's another room. Uh, we've got a Balgora and some Scarecrows. Um, we've got the the Banshees um, that can move through walls in the central area. Uh, we've got the Nothic, the Nothics, the, the gibbering mad uh, apprentices. Um, uh, we still need something for this area. So how are we doing on adjusted XP? I think we're probably over our budget at this point, but... Yeah, that's okay as long as you think the encounters are balanced. So let's get up a calculator real quick. Yeah. So... We've got the Shadow Horror. Shadow Horror is worth 5,000, which is about a medium encounter at this point. So, 
5,000, and it's by itself, so it's 5,000. It's not going to attack during the other encounters, they're just there to introduce the players to the theme and so forth. Um, one Bargora is a fairly easy encounter, it's 1,800. Uh, the Scarecrows, likewise, 200 each, but there's six of them, so that's 2,400 in terms of adjusted. <laughs> uh, so, I, with regards to adjusted XP, there's a, a number of modifiers depending on the number in an encounter and whether or not the encounter is part of a wave encounter and terrain and so forth that uh, influences how difficult an encounter is and uh, then you calculate the adjusted XP for that encounter um, uh, which reflects like additional difficulty basically um, and each player at this level theoretically speaking uh, you've got to eyeball it, you've got to really think about it, which is what I'm doing at the moment um, rather than taking it as um, gospel, uh, but it is a helpful tool to sort of make sure you're in the right ballpark of what the game thinks the players can take. Um, and then fine-tune it on the fly, because you're the GM, that's what you do. Um, that's part of the reason why setting up encounters in separate spaces is a good idea, uh, because that way uh, you can take away stuff that the players can't see and pretend like that was the encounter in the first place if it's going really badly basically ideally you don't want to kill them uh, so there's three of them there and three of them is times two so 3300 times two is 6600 alright so at this point we're up to 15800 of our um, I'm going to give I'm going to offer them an NPC um, so our budget uh, is going to either be 45,000 or 36,000. So we're going to try for 36,000. See if we can get it get it there. Uh, a Beholder in Lair. Oh. Let's do the 10,001 10, 10, for the moment. See if we can adjust other stuff. Nothics. Nothics are separate. The Nothics are separate encounters, but I'm thinking they're going to flee to each other while they blast things. Ah, but I can't do that because I've... Ah. So, this is this is where... Uh, uh, the encounter design... So, uh, each of these Nothics are essentially a separate encounter. Except these two. Because these two can get to each other. This one by running to this door and into this room. This one by running to this door and into this room. And that way they can become a, the same encounter. Uh, that's not true of this Nothic. So let's put another Nothic here. That can theoretically... These two encounters can join each other. And... Another no thick here. That way, that way we've essentially got three no thick encounters, and that's okay. To the point that I think we, what we might do is put that no thick in here, and then have the no thicks be the ones making the scarecrows, because that's what they think the beholder wants. So that can that gives us a use for the empty rooms. Uh, the empty rooms are scarecrow storage areas. It also increases the difficulty of the Nothic encounters because we can dot some scarecrows in as well. Chuck these two in here. And they were going to use that mimic room as a scarecrow holder room, but then the mimic got them. Yeah, there we go. Gives them an early warning system as well. Okay, okay, right. I think we've got the cent the central area seems good. We've got we've got a, a, a cu couple of uh, we've got a unique encounter that gets them to think about going through walls and stuff, and then we've got a, a couple of um, uh, sort of linked space base encounters. These two no thicks are a bit of an odd one. So I think what we're probably going to do is 
because these two scarecrows can theoretically go to either this room or this room. Um, but they're probably going to be coming from this, almost certainly going to be coming from this direction or this direction. Mm. So I guess depending on which one they go to first, the scarecrows will go to the first one, and the second one, um, either these glyphs or this glyph are going to be a trap if the beholder isn't looking that way. Just a basic trap, probably a glyph of warding, honestly, because they're glyphs. That's the obvious thing. And again, we're, we're being obvious with our themes rather than subtle. We have the social encounters around the outside. Um, the spectators, uh, the only social encounter we don't have around the outside is the shadow horror and uh, the sort of entrance to the dungeon. So, going on that theme, with regards to things the beholder fears. Oh. Green slards have slards have fear. Ooh. Okay. I think we can have a slard section. <laughs> slards are great. I love slards. So Yeah, yeah. They've been attracted by the reality warping of the beholder and conjured in. So let's go in with the the good ones. Let's have a death slard. And what else? Uh, we've got grey slards. Now, considering how how distant uh, these all are from each other, uh, we can uh, get rid of this encounter, get rid of the slards. Uh, we'll have a grey slard. So look at the descriptions of slards again. Death slards. The, the okay, okay. The Dragoon mobs of red and blue slardy. Grey slardy extension. The will of their masters. Taking on her. her, her okay. Aaron's doom. Uh, green slard. Permanently transforms itself into a grey slard. Red slards and blue slards. Okay. Okay. Alright. Alright. So. Let's not actually use a death slard. Because he hasn't come. He hasn't come here. Let's use a grey slard, a green slard advisor, and some red and blue slard. So we'll have the these two in here, because this is the treasure room. Ooh, that's a big boy. He's a big boy. Okay, alright, alright, alright. Let's have him in here then. Because he's a big boy. Yeah, that's better actually. Um, and then. The reds are the chumps. How big are reds? Reds are large. How big are blues? I think they're also large. They are. Okay. Hmm. Tricky. How tough are blues? Blue is a 2,900. Can reds teleport? Can any? Can they all teleport? No. Can gr 
screens teleport. I'm thinking instead of the Balgoro, we might have one of these appear in front of the, the party. Um, no. Can these teleport? I thought, I thought they used to be able to teleport more. Hmm. Okay, so the Death Slard plane shifted them here with a Green Slard. It's so big. It's not the right environment for them, really, I don't think. Unless we have them. One there, one there, guarding areas. That might be better, actually. But the blue is like a big guy. And the reds inject it, and the tadpoles transform into blue or three, or green. Okay, right, so... Two reds, one blue. not an ideal encounter space for them, really. Um, but they should be scary enough that... And, uh, again, ideally, because of the size of the doors and so forth, they'll be sort of slightly restricted from helping each other. is a good thing because it stops the encounters from getting out of control which is the last thing you want okay okay yeah that's quite a good setup so we got slots this Bogora just isn't isn't quite right hmm he's not in theme the spectators in theme the the Dow, the cloakers, every, everything else is from an uh, they're from other planes of existence. The the scarecrows have been built by the Nothics. Maybe I should have a Nothic in there. I'll have a look through the monster manuals again. See if I can find something else. Ooh, Will of the Wisps. They're uh, cool. They feed on fear. Maybe. They're not a bad enemy to use. Mm. Hags only. Wisps devour. Hmm. Yetis. Uh, Yunti abominations can cast fear, but they're really not right for this. Ultraloths can cast fear. Beholder zombies can cast fear. Okay. Let's have a look at VGM. Oh yeah, um, so nightmares. Uh, what you may call it, Volos has uh, altered it. Beholders. Hmm. If we have the spectators looking over the treasure, death kiss can be in something. A gazers. Yeah, I think we should use a death kiss and a gazer. How difficult are they? Five thousand nine hundred. 
Gorth isn't something I want to use. Gazer. Nuisance pet. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Okay. So let's let's give him a gazer familiar. That sticks with him in the shadows. We'll have the spectator not hiding, actually guarding this treasure. But they can still talk to it. And we will use a death kiss instead of that Balgora. So, get rid of the Balgora. We'll stack these scarecrows like they're stacked in other rooms. And this room can be a death kiss. Yes. Which immediately hits home the idea that this place is a beholder lair and it's full of the nightmares of a beholder. Bingo. That's a bingo. Placement. Let's put it here. There. That's better. Yeah. Ooh, or maybe here. <laughs> no, we'll put it here. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay, okay. Last thing to do. Tot up the encounters. Slard. Oh, yeah. Slard tadpoles. Have a, a spawning room in here. It's the hatchery. That's why the green slot's in there. Taking care of it for the grey. There we go. And this buddy go over here. Because he actually can intervene in that fight. Alright. So, I hope that gives you some insight into the encounter process. All I've got to do now is work out a sort of conventional system for traps. And that's that's completable in a one shot. I think what I'm probably going to do is I think I'm actually going to get rid of this bit. I think it's extraneous. Too much of a red herring. There are areas they can rest. The border's not going to come to them. But if they rest, the beholder rests as well, and that maybe conjures more horrors. Ah, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what we're going to do. Okay. So, hope you've enjoyed that. Um, I've got all these encounters uh, set up now. I've got the chest set up with the keys. Um, the, yeah... Yeah, okay. 
I think that's done. So, uh, look forward to that later at 7 p.m. GMT uh, when we get a stream it. Until then, uh, have a good one, folks, and see you later.